Hello, welcome everyone to The Distraction. It is Tuesday, Movie Review Tuesday. I am Jeremy Lambert, joined by the artistic analyst, Joe Holbert. Joe, that's just your nickname moving forward. It's in the brackets on the uh, the YouTube video, and I'm not going to come up with a fun nickname every week. You are just the artistic mm. analyst. It's very fitting for this week, too. Wouldn't yes. you agree? Yes. This is a week in which art should be analyzed, in my view. Um, I'm very excited, Jeremy. I, I'm a little bit disappointed that you didn't call me the ace of the universe just for this week, but I accept that this is my new branding. I stick with it, and I'm ready to break down some film. That's what I'm here to do today. How about the the ace artistic analyst? You want to do that? That works. Okay. Yeah, that works. I think so. Is it definitely best as ace artistic artistic ace analyst? Sounds also pretty cool. Artistic. Is that, that what you want? I will. I I'm so. literally going to change the. Uh, the text right now like if you're watching on youtube you can so see dramatic. the text changed <laughs> there we go artistic ace analyst it, it has been okay. changed your, your title has been updated for this podcast only you're, you're not going to yeah. be the ace next podcast because no. it doesn't fit but for this one it does i have to pass the torch is what you're saying <laughs> right, i have a one week rain I'll, I'll i'll run on top of the ace but that works that means i'm the best of the analysts of the art you know yeah it's sort of more I do like that very much. Now, here's the thing, Jeremy. Um, we're, we run into a problem here. Because you know how we reviewed They Live? And They Live was an actual good film. And the bit was that you didn't want it to be a good film. Remember <laughs> right. this? Yes. Um, the issue with this is, this is a good film. But I think you're happy it was a good film. And that leaves us in a unique <laughs> stand-in for podcast content. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, this was a good film. Yes. Yeah, I'm happy. The thing is, like, Look, we reviewed uh, My Dad as a Heel Wrestler, starring the entire New Japan universe, but really <laughs> starring really starring uh, Hiroshi Tanahashi. Um, yes. Yeah, it was a good film. It's very, like, it's just a wrestling film, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, there's not much more to it than that. Like, there's some, there's some good jokes and some good bits and stuff, but I don't know what I expected from this film. The fact that it's just, like, it's a wrestling storyline... Like, that, that's what this film is. It's interesting because I knew this film was, like, you know, quote-unquote good. And I think it's actually very good. But I'd, I had, like, read that it wasn't a complete joke. Um, as the title and Hiroshi Tanashi may make you think. <laughs> you know, it's, it sounds like it's going to be sad. But what is actually in this film? So this film is definitely something that was aimed at a younger audience. When I say aimed, that's probably the wrong word. But, like, it's supposed to be palatable for a younger audience, right? Right. So I knew they wasn't going to, like, kind of expose the whole deal and, like, have uh, Okada calling spots and stuff. (laughs) However, there is, like, enough interesting ideas here that beyond the sort of grand ending, it's like an actual exploration into pro wrestling, and it's legitimately interesting to me. Like, there's a lot of themes here that pop up that capture wrestling and the essence of how weird wrestling is in terms of fiction better than most things I've seen. And I want to be clear at the start of this pod here. I know that it's the cool guy thing to do to come on and be like, actually great film starring Hiroshi Tanahashi. Like, I know, trust me, I know that's what you're thinking. Oh, Joe's doing the hipster bit. I'm not. I promise you, this film is actually good and genuinely captivating. To the point where, Jeremy, I'm going to expose this now, I'm going to reveal it. I did not cry, but I fluttered somewhat <laughs> down the stretch. My legs began to shake a little bit there as I reached the conclusion. This is a pretty beautiful movie. I really believe that. I, I believe it as well. There's there's plenty of movies about wrestling. We're going to review another one next week. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Um, this one is certainly... like This is up there. You know, People praise The Wrestler of being like the, this great wrestling yeah. film. And like it is. Uh, but... I think this was actually better than The Wrestler as far as like exploring. Yeah, I said it. Uh, Hiroshi Tanahashi should have been nominated for an Oscar. I'm pretty sure Mickey Rourke was nominated for an Oscar. So Tanahashi should have been nominated for an Oscar. Um, You know, The Wrestler explores like the deep dark side of wrestling of just like a washed up person. Like this, this doesn't go to that. This was just very... It explores wrestling in a very... I saw you use this term on Twitter, like, inside baseball kind of way. Mm. And, and that's certainly what this film does. Yeah, I'm interested as to how this would play someone with no knowledge. Because I think it would work, because I think the relationship between the family 
um, the central family is like interesting enough, compelling enough that you'll be into it. But as a wrestling fan, there's so many like little gems. Like, there'll be lines of dialogue that legitimately sound like one of us explaining wrestling to a friend that doesn't watch, right? Yeah. Like it's, and there's a character in particular that's sort of given that role uh, in the film. I actually feel like I'm doing a film review now. Is this <laughs> this is weird, Jeremy? I'm not sure. About it. So this set the scene a little bit. So do you have Tanahashi's um, like actual wrestler name? I know that the other name, which we'll get into, but he's original. <laughs> wrestler name in this film uh umoda i, I think it's I something like that i don't have it i, I should probably okay. pull up the cast list but yeah it, it's something it's something like that he's cockroach mask all right that's what we know him yes as. he's cockroach so, mask. So the, the film starts with him <laughs> battling uh kojima i believe it was right yes. and this is 10 years ago and this is the z1 climax folks in the in the uh lion Lion Pro Wrestling, right? Yes. I'm pretty sure that's what it's called. And this far, this whole direction is fascinating to me because it is nothing but New Japan wrestlers in a completely New Japan like aesthetic and kind of ideology presentation. The whole deal, but it is not New Japan. Everything is just adjusted by name, which is brilliant. <laughs> okay, what's, what you got here for the name? Do we, uh, do we the name it? is Takashi Omura. Okay. So he is the ace, right? He's the big yes. star. Um, and then that's the opening scene, and then we go, okay, 10 years later. And this, this sets up the all-time great character change in the history of pro wrestling. <laughs> but effectively, as you would expect from the title of the film, uh, Hiroshi's son, again, I'm going to go with Hiroshi Tanahashi, that's the name I'm going with. Until yeah, we, we, always, the, use, we always use the, the wrestler name. Yes, the master man gimmick, which I will refer to out of respect. <laughs> um so he doesn't know what his dad does, and that's the whole deal here. He's kind of in pursuit of that. And there are some wonderful like pieces just as it builds to this, right? where he's basically like bullied into asking his dad what he does for a living, which yeah. is an all-time play, by the way, by his classmates, who legitimately like are so desperate for the answer, they chase him down the next week, which is an incredible amount of excitement for saying that really has nothing to do with him. It, so everything gets set up because... Uh, the kid's name, T- Tanahashi's kid's name is Shota, Shota Yumino. Yes. Um, yes. And <laughs> that's all I could think of every time they called Same. him Shota. I was like, oh, this is the kid that grows up to be a Shota Yumino. And instead of, he, he's so disappointed in his father, Tanahashi, that John Moxley uh, ad- adopts him. <laughs> yes, that's the sequel. Yeah. That'll be coming eventually. Yeah. <laughs> that's the sequel that we're making. Uh, that yes. way that we got to get crowdfunded or whatever platform we're using. Uh, yes. Go fund me. Um, but he he does the the thing at school it was like oh what's my dream or what what does my dad do for a living or whatever like and and what's my dream like that's what it is like he doesn't know what his dad does he talks about his mom and he just says like my dad i'm gonna grow up to be big and strong my dad he's been giving me protein and his mom is like offended (laughs) mom is offended that he's getting this protein um and then he's he just doesn't know and we find out later that, you know, the, I mean, we know he's a wrestler, but he, his classmates are like wrestling fans. He, he follows his dad. Real quick, I'm going to rewind. The kid who follows Shota, we don't know who this kid is, but he's talking in the background as Shota and his mom are giving looks. And this kid, like, doesn't write about his dreams. <laughs> he's like, my parents told me I had to write something. Oh, yes, this is very fun. I agree. This is very good. And it was like an Easter egg because you're focusing on the visuals with the subtitles. Yeah, like, exactly. Very good. Yeah. And yes. he's like, I don't have dreams. Like, I didn't want to do this assignment. My parents told me I had to. And it's like, mm-hmm. so my dreams are just like, be like done with this assignment. And there was also, the other good one was, the first speech we saw like perfectly set up the whole idea of the film because it was literally a kid just being like, my dad is a completely normal dad who has a very <laughs> simple job and I also would like to go and have a simple job. And it's like, yes, I understand where this is going now. Thank you. It actually gets more complex than that. But at that point, I was like, yes, this is a film called My Dad is a Heel Rest. And I was like, it is indeed that, yes. Uh, so Shoto follows his dad to to his workplace. He follows him to the, I, I guess, the Lions Arena. I don't think. It's not the Tokyo Dome. I'll tell you that much, folks. No, it is. Uh, certainly not. <laughs> so he no, follows him. Down. Right, business is down. Yeah, yes, yes, business is down. Uh, he follows them to that. He runs into to Makabe and everybody, and then he goes out, and he's just watching this wrestling match, and he sees mm-hmm. uh, his classmate friend who is there. This is when we meet Kazuchika Okada, who goes by the name Dragon George. <laughs> what a fantastic, fantastic yes. name. 
<laughs> I did want to mention, by the way, so when you talked about he followed his dad to the workplace, right? The little moment there where he's reminded of his friend saying that perhaps his dad's like mafia. Yeah. As, as Tana has hands money over and stuff. Was really good. I, but yeah, so you're right. So he gets in and he's watching Ishii and Goto, I believe. Yeah. Right? And here's the thing. This sounds like such a silly comment because it's literally the whole New Japan roster. But the fact that the wrestling matches are literally just like the New Japan guys doing their <laughs> matches is so fun to me. Because how many times you watch these films, I mean, there's not a ton of them, I guess, that I've sat and watched, but it never looks like pro wrestling, does it? The stuff that's going on. This doesn't just look like wrestling. You have seen matches that right. have this exact form with these exact men. I mean, we'll get into it later, but the, the final scene is almost hysterical with how much it's like a match we've seen a hundred times. But we'll get to that. So, he, you know, he's sitting there, he, he walks in, and he's spotted by a girl who's in his class, right? Yes. And she says, for her dream, she likes guys that are tall, strong, and blonde. And I think that was the three factors she was looking for. And it becomes clear to us that is because she's a fan of Dragon George. <laughs> so he sits down with, with this young lady and her father, and they're, they're talking about the rest. And he doesn't know who Dragon George is, bless him. Um, but it becomes clear to us as the audience, because we know the film is called My Dad is a Heel Wrestler, <laughs> It is very likely that his dad is going to be wrestling uh, Dragon Jaws. <laughs> so, there, and, you know, I'm expecting, and I'm, I don't know if you agree with this, right, but I'll kind of sell what I was thinking. So, I'm expecting Tanahashi to come out as just like the ultimate heel. Like, he's like spitting at fans, putting the middle <laughs> finger up, just being a dick. And instead, out comes Cockroach Mask <laughs> from under the ring. He's got a whole gimmick, he's got a mask, he's got like a trash can. For a four dimensional trash can, yes. okay? <laughs> What was Taguchi's name? A uh, blue bottle mask. Blue bottle <laughs> yeah. mask is in his corner. And I did not realise it was Taguchi until he took his mask off. And I nearly erupted. I was so happy at this. Like, it isn't just a heel character. It is like the apps. It's like a Crockett Promotions job guy. Yeah. Like, you know what? He'll just give you, like, one name. Like, you know, Cockroach Mark. Like, it's, it's terrible. And the kid doesn't realise until he does this pose that, that Tanashi showed him. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> and he shows him that and that's a lovely photo that you sent me i believe right you, yeah you tweeted it, you that's talk. that's the thumbnail for this uh yeah. for this podcast yes. every interaction between tanash and his son is just so delightfully wholesome it really <laughs> is right? um and that's the best one so yes yeah, so he recognizes the pose he realizes and he cries which hilariously the young girl he's sitting with takes this as him being such a big fan <laughs> of dragon george that he burst into tears at the victory so, what a way to set the table for what follows. This is an incredible scene. It really is. How, what was your reaction to Cockroach Mask appearing from under the ring? I, I knew he wore a mask because I'd seen pictures when I was searching for a thumbnail okay. for this. I did not know he was going to be Cockroach Mask. I, I, was, I was with you. I thought he was going to be like this really badass kind of like ultimate heel who just hates all the fans and almost like jay white esque in, right. in that sense and it's it's not at all he's like uh tai chi or something in the way in the way he performs but it, i did not <laughs> he's got the roach spray when he yes. sprays people. which he does for an hour yeah. <laughs> and, and no one ever sells it they just sort of go like this and just sit there for an hour while he goes back and forth it's incredible um this, I imagine there's someone listening to this that is thinking, oh no, they've invented another film for the sake of the podcast. This is real. <laughs> yes. Cockroach Mask is a real thing. <laughs> and I remind you, we like this film. So anyway, there's a few little neat touches that, that kind of are like, as a wrestling fan, you enjoy them more. But for the sake of plot, there is a great, I have one great quote from this film. Now, normally, I will know a great line because of the delivery of it. But sometimes the dialogue is so good that it, it, it beyond past... Just like, I remember the, one of my favorites, Jeremy, was... Um, rules money are meant play. to be fucked. Yes. <laughs> and anyone can deliver that, and it's funny, right? The man is saying rules are meant to be fucked. That is funny, inherently funny. But there is a great one here that even translates over the subtitles as excellent, and that is Tanahashi, in despair, asking his wife for a genuine answer to the question, how could I ever tell him I'm cockroach mom? And I said to that... <laughs> I have no clue, Hiroshi. I don't know how. I don't know how you're ever going to tell him that. But his kid knows now, right? And that's what he wrote. And then what happens is poor Shota gets caught up in a lie, which yes. we'll get into. But Jeremy, I ask you now, how could 
Hiroshi ever tell his son that he's got Roach Mask? <laughs> Seriously, help him out on this one. I don't I don't think you can. Look, he should have done this a long... How old is Shota? Because he's been Cockroach Mask for nine years. <laughs> he's sure at, I would imagine... <laughs> It's made clear that he's the smallest kid in his class, right? Yeah. Because no one believes he can't be. He can't be more than like five or six, right? I'm really bad at ages. Okay. So am I. But I think that's a compliment to us both, and we're not so you know that that's yeah. that's a good thing. But I would agree. He's. Look, I'll put it this way: he's not ten. No. <laughs> that's what. That's where I'm gonna go. With no. That, okay. He's less than ten. Definitely okay. not. Um. <laughs> I feel like it would actually be easy to tell that I'm cockroach mask. I. He, it almost seems like he's struggling more to just tell his son that he's like a wrestler because he wants like the whole right. wrestling business kept away from his son. Not that he's just a heel. It's like he doesn't want his, his son to know like, oh, this is what my dad does for a living, which I can't blame mm-hmm. him. Um, but sure. when when uh, Shota is at the event and, you know, he, he spots kind of his son there and he runs out crying and everything and Tanahashi follows him. And yeah, Tanahashi has the conversation with the wife, tries to have the conversation with the kid. And it's just, the kid goes back to school and he's, he is bullied into basically admitting that like Dragon George is his dad because he's like, Oh, my dad's a pro wrestler. And the, the girl who likes Dragon George, wants the girl up to marry Dragon George, is like, yeah. your dad is Dragon George? And the Shota just doesn't have the heart to say, like, no, he's Cockroach Mask. Yes. <laughs> My dad is Dragon George. And so that, that leads to a whole other event where he's got to get the uh, Dragon George autograph to impress this girl. Right. And he, so he goes off and he steals the autograph from a character that I have to say this, I do not know her name. She is wonderful in this film. Whoever name, this actor is, she's name, glorious. What's that? The, the actual actor's name. I don't oh, know yes. The, the actress's name is Risi Naka. Risi Naka? Okay. The, her name in the movie in, is Michiko Oba. Truly wonderful in this film, just purely on how like her face conveys so much in yes. this movie. <laughs> and more than that, it's a brilliant character because I think we both... At the point of where she was introduced, we both probably felt we had a handle on what this film was going to be, right? Okay, this kid's going to have to come to grips with the fact that his dad is a heel wrestler. Fine. But she adds this whole other element to it. Dare I say, Jeremy, layers <laughs> to, the, to the deal. Because she is the young lady that wants to grow up in Mario Carter. She is, oh, sorry, sorry, <laughs> Dragon George. She is that for Tanahashi's like, prior self. So she still roots for the cockroach mask. But not only that, she's also like this awesome kind of... She like represents the wrestling fan in the audience, right? right. Like, and she has these great moments of dialogue where she has to explain to Shota, like, there needs to be a villain for the sake of wrestling. And she would say stuff like, you know, wins and losses aren't the point of this. And what it does is it doesn't expose wrestling because as a young fan there does not want wrestling exposed for them. They just went to see Tanahashi in a film, right? I get it. <laughs> But if, you're, if you are, like, a hardcore wrestling man, which he's actually referred to at one point, she gives you, like, these little Easter eggs of, like, they're actually explaining wrestling better than films that spell it out, which is genuinely pretty impressive, I thought, right? They explain the essence of wrestling better than films where it's like, yeah, and then he blades. Like, this actually does it pretty well, I thought. <laughs> a lot of these wrestling films, I mean, we, we saw it with, like, the main event, um, and we're going to see it in a movie review next week. Like they treat these wrestling matches as like their shoots, but then yeah. there is also we know their works. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like like the main event we, we were joking around of like, all right, why doesn't Keith Lee just do this with the kid? Like it's all a work. Why doesn't he feel bad for the kid? But it's like, oh, it's a competition, you gotta win the tournament. It's a shoot. And like she is here to be sort of that Brit because the kid seems to think like it's kind of a shoot as well. He's like, right. Oh, my dad, he can't compete, all this stuff. But she is here to kind of bridge it and just being like, it's kind of a shoot work. And I, I feel like that's how a lot of uh, fans of Japanese sort of take it. Like, they know it's a work, but they treat it as a shoot. And that's right. what this young lady represents. You're definitely supposed to, at the end of the film, sort of like um, view him more as a performer. Right. And dare I say, an artist than like a fighter. Even though they say stuff like, you know, you're going to fight. Are you going to get back in there and fight? The way that he ends this film is very much like wrestling fear, you know, which is which is cool. Um, there is also just little things like, so 
I was just found it hilarious that every time Tanner was on screen, they made him run, and it's like, <laughs> listen, Tanner can't run. Like he just can't do it anymore. So there I There's am. There's a knee injury. Exactly. I'm thinking I'm all clever. Oh, I'm going to do a bit about Tanner not being able to run. Can't even run for the sling blade. <laughs> and then they're like, no, this is actually a major plot in the film. Yeah. Because this is what changed his whole career. And I just said, well, that was delightful. I could tell that he couldn't run. He can't run. And now you explain to me why he can't run and why this is relevant. And that is explained to us as the reason. So, again, this is where, as a wrestling fan, you can kind of enjoy it in its own way. Effectively, the Cockroach Miles character is like one of those like smoke and mirror deals. Right. right? Where it's like, the guy can't go, bless his heart, let's put this gimmick on him, he can do nothing of note and lose matches. The film sort of frames it that way, but that's the way I take it, because it's pretty much presented that way, right? You know, effectively. It is. I mean, he was he was the top star 10 years ago, right. and then one year later, he suffers this really bad knee injury off of the, uh, the high fly which is the high fly flow. Um, they didn't try. Dragon George using the, the dragon maker. That was what it's called, right? Incredible. <laughs> what, a, what a choice that was. Yes, Dragon George. Good Lord. Um, but he, he suffers this knee injury, and he just he can't work like he used to. That's why he had to be the cockroach mask, so people yeah. just didn't expect him to go out there and be Omora because he, he couldn't be that person anymore so he's been cockroach mask for not by the way they got nine years out of this cockroach yeah. mask <laughs> like i yeah. feel like that's that's a big credit to to gato uh i who i think the guy's name i'm looking at the cast list is a uh, kohoda kohonda in, in this yeah. film that's like the booker man's name credit to him getting nine years out of uh cockroach mask right because if you if you've watched this film like it's all work and like his journey as it were he's the best booker ever yeah right? like, <laughs> He, t- he turned this into a hot main event match, like out of nowhere. It's incredible, but we'll get to that. So, yes, I- I'm with you. And there's also, like, people listening to this may think we're being analysts, Jeremy. They may think we're looking too deep. You're an analyst. I'm just I'm just here. Well, I feel like when I come in so high, like, you're like, I need a match, Joe, because this is going to be a special <laughs> show. So that's where I feel like we're at right now. But there's, there's some moments there where... Like, his wife says to him, you're only going to be a heel for, like, a few more years, right? Yeah. And he's like, it's been nearly 10. <laughs> <laughs> and he asks, um, uh, Blue Bottle. Blue Bottle? Blue, Blue Bottle, bottle Mask. mask. <laughs> Incredible. So he, he asks him, to Gucci days, like, how long have you been a heel? And he's like, 20 years. I love it. <laughs> like, it's very much, it's allowing you to appreciate it from that point of view. But then there's also, at the end, like, an epic sort of, rocky-esque uh, fight with mr dragon george so the deal with the um with uh, the other lady who used to be a fan and is still a fan of, of the cockroach mask so she is like a, a she's me basically right she writes features Jeremy, yes. correct um she's a sheet and like me, yeah and like like <laughs> me she's very she's struggling with the notion that her cool story about an understated forgotten wrestler will do less clicks than a list about a popular wrestler that isn't in the film. That's what I infer from her body language. Okay, Jeremy, you cover that? Yes. So she writes um, a, a big piece on uh, a cockroach mask who is in the Z1 because an injury has taken out two wrestlers, two injuries out two wrestlers. So she starts working on this piece, and it's made clear to us that she knows um, the, that this is the same person here, right? Which yes. later on in the film, it wasn't the case for everyone. She is very much a smart fan. Like that's 100% its frame. So she starts working on this feature, and then he just loses. <laughs> yeah. so you are. He loses to, by the way, uh, Makabe. Oh, yes. His, yes, name his name is? in this film, Sweet Gorilla Mariyama. You could bet everything <laughs> you own, that's his choice, right? Very cool names being here. He's like, Sweet Gorilla. Don't give me Sweet Gorilla. Rest you can feel it. Sweet Gorilla I need. So... Um, <laughs> So, yeah, so he, and what happened was in that match, he wants to do the fly flow, the high fly. That's it, the fly just high fly. fly. No, the high fly. high fly. Yeah. Wow. No flow. Okay, so the high fly, <laughs> he wanted to do here. Yes. Um, and it costs him, you know, the kid runs off. I can't remember what happened. Oh, this is when the kid makes it clear, right? Because he takes his mask off and he says, Daddy. Yeah. Doesn't say it like that, but subtitles and such. So. This is when um, we have this like beautiful, like poetic moment in which the young girl tells him he she hates him just like he did to his own dad earlier. Yeah. And at this point, Jeremy, 
the legs are starting to shake. I'm starting <laughs> to feel it. Because I do think my enjoyment of this film and my emotional connection to it is very much enhanced by the fact that I just love Hiroshi Tanahashi. <laughs> like, it makes me sad. When he's looking all, like, downbeat, and I just go, oh, come on, man. You don't hate him. He's good. He's a good father. He does the, the sling blade and all that cool stuff. So... <laughs> That happens, um, and he loses the match, and he has to go to the hospital. I legitimately thought he was dead for like 30 seconds. Very scary moment in cinema history for me, but that's just me. He passes out backstage to Gucci, yeah. you know, because he unmasked and everything, and to Gucci and the, the promoter, like, trying to walk away and stuff, and he just collapses backstage. Yeah, he has to go to the hospital. The son is, the son is very distraught with everything, yeah. uh, but we get, the, we get the big kind of rebound here. Okada wins the Z1. Or Dragon George, sorry. Dragon oh, George course, right? wins the Z1. Okada wins. Dragon, we need to make this a thing. Hashtag Dragon George wins, LOL. We need to make a full mate. Anytime Okada wins, any he match, does. He does, by the way. Like, he wins. They, they bill him as undefeated and everything. Like, no one has beaten this man in yes. in Lions, uh, Lion Pro Wrestling. Uh, so, Okada, or Dragon George, wins the Z1. And during his like press conference and everything they're asking him oh who who can you face and and whatnot shoda's out to dinner with his mom and dragon george is like there is one man who used to right. you know used to be at the top and everything i saw a little bit from him in the z1 i won him back and he calls out uh omora and the the kid shoda stands up in the restaurant and is like yeah my dad's gonna fuck you up he didn't say that but like he's he's very excited by all of this he's super excited he's like okay my dad is back in this yes he's I mean, i'm sorry i was taking off guard. i did want to go back i imagine when they're making this film they say okay what can we rename the promotion and someone said well have you seen the logo and I said, no show me and it's the big lion there and they said what if we called it Lion Pro Wrestling? Brilliant. They go ahead. The, the, the logo. Thing, the logo. Someone turns around and he's like, guys, um, you can't use our logo. <laughs> like, this Lion Pro Wrestling. It's why we call it. So they have to just get a different lion. <laughs> the, logo the, the logo is legitimately like, it's the New Japan logo. And then they just like stretched it, you know, and you can like click the image and then just try to yeah. stretch it a little bit so it looks different sean complains that you're always stretched on this show that's that's the uh yeah. the lion logo lion pro wrestling is they just yeah, the stretch the just like in. a yeah. side mug shot sort of. like, right. that's it that's the end of the deal but um yeah that's worth knowing but so then um she gives him so the feature is cancelled because he doesn't make the z1 final um and it's given to uh, the the, uh, the cockroach mask himself, Hiroshi Tanahashi, and he decides he's gonna do the, the fight right with yes. with um, Dragon George. How did you feel about the way they hand? Because this is where it goes full like wrestling is performance. Because rather than returning to his heroic past, he like embraces the cockroach mask, right? Like he embraces that he's a heel. This is very interesting. This part. This is what. I mean, the the expected predictable thing would have been all right he comes out as omara and right. he has this big showdown <clears throat> with uh dragon george you know whoever wins wins you the expected thing would probably be omara wins you have the happy ending with the kid and everything right. no he comes out as cockroach mask like he 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 performs more like omara but yeah he he's a heel he's not gonna go away from mm -hmm. that and yeah you know, after the match, Dragon George makes the comment, like, this is not who I expected, but you still put up a great fight and everything. I was thrown off in, like, a, the best way possible that he came out still as Cockroach Mask and still, like, I was, when I was watching the film and I was expecting Omara to come out and then I see Cockroach Mask, I was like, I was shocked. I was stunned, but in yeah. a great way. Yeah, it was very interesting because, so here's where it gets funny because the match is literally yeah, Tanahashi Okada. Yeah, like, okay. I mean... <laughs> All of their sequences, all of their go-to chains, like, it's <laughs> exactly that. But Tanahashi has a mask on, and Okada is Dragon George, which is like, <laughs> sure, man, like fine. But um, so that's funny in itself. But then they they do this big dramatic New Japan style like main event match. He goes up, he does the high fly, he hits it, and Okada kicks out. Oh my god, the two point nine kick out, the Okada special so on the two point nine kick out. That's the thing. I, I know it sounded silly when I said it earlier, but like, 
I do think it's worth saying how good the wrestling matches are in this it, because it's legit. You feel like you're watching wrestling. Yeah, right? it's legitimately like you said it. They're just having an Okada and Tanahashi match. It's clipped <laughs> it's because it's a movie. It's not like 25, 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Um but it's it's just a best of Okada time. You get the Sling Blade, you get the Tombstone, you get the mm-hmm. Dragon Maker. You get even like, dude, Okada does the dive over the barricade onto mm-hmm. <laughs> onto a cockroach mask uh, who's in the fans and stuff. You get the dramatic oh nineteen. Is he gonna get in the ring yeah, type deal? Like, like the whip him into the guardrail. It is legitimately like a best of. Okada right. Tanahashi main event. The 2.9 kick out killed me. Absolutely killed me. Really great stuff. And so then, when that happens, you kind of know, right? So then they do the classic Okada hits him with the drop kick in midair deal, which they've yeah. done a million times. <laughs> and he wins with the with Dragon the, Maker. The Dragon Maker, yes. Which, which makes a ton of sense, definitely. <laughs> um, so then, and the kind of post match really goes in on this, but. The idea here is, like, we go back to that kind of... Um, I'm reminded, at least, of her dialogue earlier where she said, you know, winning and losing and such. So she sort of, in as many words, without saying it, it's sort of like, wrestling is more than just, like, who wins the fake match. She doesn't say that because it's not what the, sort of the film is. But it's very much a representation of, like, he's the hero here because he was so great in his performance, right? And that is, like... That works within the framework that this is a real fight that the kid has just watched, but it also works within the framework of that's wrestling, right? Like we've seen that a million times. But then, when you're comfortable with the notion that, okay, the villain's so good at being a villain, he gets cheered, we then get a flashback to show his mum saying, boo your dad, because that's the best way to cheer a heel, is to well, boo them. Yeah, there's that, but even before that, Okada does this, this speech of like, Right, uh, you're right at first, yeah. Yeah, he does a speech of like, oh, it wasn't Omora that showed up, but you still put up a great fight and everything. And it's like, you know, I respect <laughs> you and stuff. And you, this is when I was expecting, okay, they're going to come, they're going to shake hands, it's going to be like, yeah. cool, I respect. Cockroach Mask game breaking character, all right? This was not, he is a heel through and through. He's trying mm-hmm. to, he's trying to, to Suzuki, uh, Dragon George here. Like, he's going after him with a chair and stuff. And that's when we get the flashback of uh shoto with his mom and his mom basically tells him if you see your dad cheating like get up and yell like that's mean cockroach mask or don't do that cockroach mask and so the the kid gets up and he yells that and i mean his dad is a heel he's embracing but the the theme there is obviously like that's his job he's a heel to to support him and that is to actually boo him and not to Mm -hmm. cheer him or feel bad for him but it is a very bold choice that, you know, in the film, for the sake of the film, he is the hero, right? Cockroach Mask yeah. is a hero for the film. But to actually end the film with him being like a spoiled loser dick because he is a heel, what a way to, like, punch home what that role is, right? Like, it was pretty brilliant. And um, I don't know, I, I think people are going to listen to this and think we're, we're, like, joking because we're talking very seriously about film while also saying Cockroach Mask. <laughs> But genuinely, it was pretty touching in the way that it was sort of, you know, he's on. He, everyone's standing up for the cockroach mask, and they say, you know, good job, cockroach mask. But he refuses this, these plaudits. Like, he wants to go out as a heel. Yeah. And his son, it finally clicks for him. He also wants him to go out that way. And then we get the lovely little deal where he changes his, like, dream job to being, uh, ba- being a bad guy like my dad. And it's like, man, what a cool film that was. I was stunned at how this was actually, like, not just pretend good, Jeremy. This was actually good, right? Incredible feat. There, there's a line that I noted down. Um, I think the the journalist says it, or maybe maybe it was Shoda. Probably should have wrote that part down. Uh, but the line <laughs> is just, my dad is a, a bad guy. He plays a bad guy, but this does not make him a bad person. Yes. Like what? A, just an incredible line of like, yeah, like he's a character playing this in wrestling, but he's a great dad. Like, he doesn't do anything yeah. wrong as a dad. I guess he showed up late to, to his little thing, but, like, he, he's still incredible. He's still a very good dad and everything. Like, I just thought that line was, like, it more it more hammered home of just, like, wrestling is a performance in this film yes. and really overall. Yeah, it was actually, as well as kind of the uh, the idea of wrestling can be told without it being, like, flagrant and, like, 
you know, then get a blade and do this. I mean, by the way, it sounds like I hate the wrestler. I don't know if you do. I like the wrestler. It's just, it is one way. You know, like, it's not saying you're going to sit down and watch with the old family and sort of grin along while Paul McGill <laughs> right. cuts himself. It isn't that sort of film, but this is. Uh, there's no cutting of anyone, but it, there is a lot of grinning. Um, however, all great films that um, go under the radar, this is a Japanese film, they need to be spoiled and all the complexity and all the interesting elements need to be taken out for the sake of big cinema, Jeremy. So here's what we're going to do. We're not going to make a sequel. I've changed my mind. We are making the American version oh God. of My Dad is a Heel Wrestler. We're going to take away all the interesting elements. <laughs> we're thinking big time. Okay? But Isn't that just deal. raw? <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> raw may be better if it was like explained in this way. <laughs> they maybe should do an episode where it's just like, see that guy? That's a heel. You boo that guy. And it cuts and it's like a heel. It's like, I am a heel, boo me. That's what it should be. But who is... Because Tanahashi works... I'm going back to the wrestler. The reason Mickey Rourke works so well is because you look at Mickey Rourke and you say, yes, that man is breaking down someone help him, which is, you know, the idea. Anyone that knows anything about Hiroshi Tanahashi can confirm, yes, that man <laughs> is breaking down someone please help him. So we need someone to fit that bill for our American... Um, should we stick to WWE? Should that be our universe, firstly? Yeah, yeah. Okay, who are we looking at here, Jeremy, for the lead two roles? We need we need an ace, you know, uh, Dragon George, and we, of course, need our, our cockroach mask. Who are we thinking? Uh, I think Edge is our cockroach mask. He He's broken down, Joseph. Edge, Edge ain't... Uh... Imagine the interviews Edge would do about this film. <laughs> Imagine the layers you would find within this film. There'd be quotes popping up, like ESPN articles. Edge cried 400 times while making <laughs> My Dad Is Heel Wrestling. I love Edge, but he does that deal now where, like, he's actually made projects, and he talks about everything like it's a project. <laughs> like, he's on the WrestleMania um, 24 deal, and everyone's like, like, wrestlers are just what they are. Very simple far- characters, right? And they're like, we well, have a pandemic, and I'm here to WrestleMania. And Edge is like, you know, when you stop and think about what this means... <laughs> And you look around at production, you understand this is it's more than wrestling. You know, this, this is this is poetry in motion. This is something special. It's like, man, that guy is he's on a different planet now. So he would be great in this film. I agree. Yeah, I, I think he's perfect uh, for this. What what are we naming him? Like, we gotta have something. El Conquistador. I, El Conquistador. I guess it could be El Conquistador. <laughs> It works. I was thinking Samoa Joe for the beaten up guy, but I don't know if he would be as wholesome. No, I no, no. I, I think we gotta go Edge. I think my yeah, casting I've, is good here. I've sold myself just on the internet. <laughs> yes. So who's who's the top guy? Why don't we just do Orton and Edge and they can fight around the PC? Why don't we just do that? <laughs> Let's just do a best of Orton. They don't have to reshoot the match. Just show uh, the backlash match for the film. <laughs> Do you remember? I can't believe this was just four months ago. It feels like it's been years, but I vividly remember us being like, should our movie review just be the greatest wrestling match ever? <laughs> like, it effectively was a movie. Should we just do that? Um, that's an idea. I don't know if I can see Randy as sort of... Um, I mean, Randy's as good as we've got at this point, right? Roman? I don't know. Yeah, I think Roman would be the other choice. I was going to say Drew, but I don't know about that. I, I prefer Roman over Drew. Yeah, because we do need... I guess Randy's too close in, like, generations for Edge, too, right? We need yeah. someone that's, like, the new... Okay, I, I'm fine with Roman Reigns. Is there any other roles that need filling here? Who's Taguchi? Um, Christian. Christian, yeah. <laughs> Legitimately, the conquistadors. He's <laughs> literally the whole thing. Yes. What's Randy's name, though, man? We need a good name for Randy. Uh, Ra- wait, Roman? Roman, sorry. Roman, Roman. okay. Yes. Uh dog and then what's just like a generic person name dog jake i don't know <laughs> i knew you were gonna go dog i didn't i didn't realize you were gonna go that route with him i'm fine with okay dog jake he is dog jake now that's fine um anything else any other big roles with the need filling in this film that's about it right they're the big ones you're you're playing the journalist right of course yeah okay. that's, that's goes about saying all right um who is the uh, the? Uh, please tell me what Maccabee's name was again. We're not changing that. Name. Oh, the gorilla, sweet gorilla. 
Sweet, <laughs> sweet gorilla Samoa Joe. I okay. want Samoa Joe. Sweet gorilla. All right, you really want Samoa Joe in this film. I respect I do. Uh, he could be do. Sweet Gorilla. Yeah, we don't even need to change his name. He's just Sweet Gorilla. I, I do have a towel for you. This is nothing to do with this film, but and I swear this is the truth. I was considering watching Raw today. I normally watch it on Thursday before our podcast. Why? We're and not like, talking about Raw with Michael I'm not Thompson. talking about it. I haven't watched it. This is why. Okay. And like, I click on it, and like, I see there's no Samoa Joe, and there is Jerry Lawler. I'm just like, no. Like, I, I just stop. Let <laughs> just tell you where I'm at with my Samoa Joe need. Like, I, when I didn't see him and also saw Jerry Lawler, abandon shit. I will not watch this program. <laughs> I don't even know if I'm going to watch it. I won't even need to watch it this week. That's another term for another day. Anyway. You don't need to. What is our rating hit? So this is where my rating system has been ruined. I'm a fool. I've destroyed this thing. Do you I have... mean, this deserves five marks, Jeremy. Do you have a rating for this? <sighs> I've give... Last week, I gave the fun house like a nine. Yeah. <laughs> it ruins everything, doesn't it, really? I mean, it's your rating system. I'm giving this a ten. I nearly cried. Okay. And what more can it do to me? You know, I had Tanahashi. Great film. I loved it. It should, it should be a 10. I can't disagree with that rating. My rating, I gave the Funhouse a minus one and three quarters. Strong WCW 95. <laughs> Strong. All right, I'm going to make, I'm going to make a super obvious joke here. Yeah. Four and three quarters. If it was in the Tokyo Dome, it would have been over five. You know, that's. I thought you were gonna go with just the like, you know, the six star Tanahashi Okada, but you actually did say that was good. I was impressed by that. It maybe it was obvious the audience, but I didn't see it coming. Very right, strong. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Is it time for me to announce what we're doing next week, Jeremy? Uh, do you want to talk basketball first? We're only forty minutes into this show. Oh so. sure. Yes, okay. yes, we will do basketball. Because um, so you know, we got to tease the people for what's going on the rest of the week, so they stick around through our basketball talk. Well, what happened was, Jeremy, I looked at the time here on my Skype call and I forgot that we did a pre-podcast recording of a completely different show that will never be heard but was very good. It right, will be heard. Uh, you can, oh, no. You can, <laughs> when, we, when we launch our Patreon, you can, uh, okay. I'm putting all of the pre- and post-show banter on the Patreon and it'll be well okay. worth it. Make sure you scan that stuff. Could be some very troublesome, yeah, troublesome probably, quotes. In. Probably. So um, <laughs> here's what's going to happen. I'm going to break this down for you very simply. I'm going to just go for it kind of categorically and professionally. Mike D'Antoni is going to coach the Philadelphia 76ers. Next year, Joel Embiid is going to shoot 12 threes a game. (laughs) 12 threes a game. They will all be just as he walks past half court while Ben Simmons runs a fast break offense with no one around him. Ben Simmons will shoot. 0.7 0.7 freeze a game. That's my prediction. <laughs> exact. Note this down, folks. I think he's almost going to do one a game. I'm very excited. We've got a roster suited to Dan Tony's strengths. We've got no shooting. All big men. I'm very pumped. You know what, though? Honestly, when I read the headline, Billy Donovan, Ty Lue, Mike D'Antoni, I was like, bring me D'Antoni. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. Just give me D'Antoni. You know, like, at this point, at least there's a fun, like, science project element to him. You know? Feels like a case. The thing with D'Antoni is I love D'Antoni too. When uh, OKC had fired Scott Brooks, like I wanted D'Antoni after that. I thought he would have been great. Great on the Suns, made the most out of the, those Knicks teams, did what he could with the Rockets. Like D'Antoni's history is what it is. It's not like mm-hmm. great, especially in the playoffs. Uh, but it's almost like he gets a pass for so much. Like those Suns teams, it's like, Oh, if Amari doesn't come off the bench, they were winning it that year. Like it, it was a wrap. They were just gonna win it. The yeah. the Knicks, the Knicks like Mello, Mello just tanked them. Like it, it they would have won if if Mello just let Jeremy Lin cook and everything. Uh, and then the Rockets are just like Harden, Harden just choked. Can't do anything about Harden. And like obviously, D'Antoni has a role. Like this man plays nine man rotations every night, runs his stars, playing them forty minutes a night in blowout games and stuff. Uh, like he has his flaws and stuff, but he's taken a lot of different rosters and, and gotten to the playoffs with them. Right. And I do think that is like an appeal with the Sixers. You call it a science project. And it's like, what can he do with this roster? How can he create an offense to make yeah. this roster uh, fire on all cylinders? You know, what, what's it going to lead in the playoffs? I don't know. Ty Lue, I don't know what you're getting from Ty Lue. Like, 
the man was carried by LeBron. He, clearly, he didn't do much uh, as the assistant coach for the Clippers. And, and then Billy Donovan, you don't want Billy Donovan. He's just gonna he's gonna do the same thing Brett Brown did. At least Antony, there is an exciting uh, element there that I can see that would intrigue you. I read something very interesting, Jeremy. I believe it was Mike O'Connor, tremendous writer, and he pointed out that the supposed two leading candidates of Ty Lu and Dan Tony would tell you something about where they're going here because. We both agree D'Antoni is much better suited to Simmons, right? Like, you could see him putting together an offense where Benny's, like, just finding three-pointers everywhere, shooting shooting around him, that kind of deal. Um, and Ty Lue is a clutch guy. I'm not getting out... I'm not getting carried away here, okay? I am kind of feel like you're going to see some, like, insane drama in Philly <laughs> next year with him being Simmons. Dude. Like, I, I, I'm all for D'Antoni until I think about what Embiid does in his offense. Embiid doesn't even like being like the role man. <laughs> like, I don't know what he does. Yeah, he D'Antoni in centers to, I mean, he's not going to be Amari because Amari was the role man and yeah. had that kind of lift and would run and all that stuff. Uh, who was their center in New York? They really didn't have one. At least any, like Tyson Chandler. Tyson Chandler yeah, just, just rim protection. Right? Yeah, yeah, like rim runner, rim protection. I mean, they... <laughs> That's all Capella was until they just traded him and then right, had yeah. PJ Tucker, Robert Covington just stand behind the three point line. Yeah, centers in D'Antoni's offense, not exactly the most uh featured people there. Mm-hmm. So I could imagine if they're telling Embiid, hey, re- do more screening, stand behind the three point line, no more post ups, none of that stuff. I I don't know how he would take that. Yeah, it's because when I think D'Antoni and Simmons, like, to me, he'd want to play Simmons at, like, four or five. Like, I feel like he yes. would love a small ball Simmons lineup where yeah. he's the center. Like, And to be honest, that's probably, like, the move. But the problem is, is it's easy to say this stuff and talk about fit and all this good stuff. But, like, when you're giving up Embiid, you're most likely going to get one of those packages, which is, like, four fine players, you know? And when you do that, yeah, the, it might be a better fit, but it's, like, you're probably not more likely to win with, like, like I saw a net still, and it was like Karis LeVert, Dinwiddie, and Jarrett Allen. It's like, sure, man. But like, how good is that team actually going to be? Right? I don't know. Here's here's a trade idea for you. I, and I have two, actually. Uh, if, you, if we're talking Embiid trade, Embiid for Beal. Obviously, there's other stuff going back to Philadelphia. But the centerpiece coming back would be Bradley Beal. I mean, Beal is much better than LeVert and Dinwiddie. And I like both of those guys, but... Beal is an yeah. all-star player for a reason. Beal is one of the only guys that seems feasible that I would be willing to look at for both Simmons and Embiid, like separately, you know, because if you if you put him with Embiid, you're looking at a deal where it's like he could be his closer kind of thing, you know, like he could be the sort of uh, scorer to his rim protection because you can't give the ball to Embiid late. I've seen it enough times now. It doesn't work. <laughs> it's a turnover thing. So that works, but then the other way around too, like Simmons with, with Beal would be good. I mean, you'd have to think about that. I, I mean, I I can no longer be the guy that's just like, don't talk about any possible trade for these two guys. It seems silly at this point. I mean, you have to look at it. I just don't know. It seems like the Wizards want to do more John Wall, Brad Bill stuff, which it is does, like, oh, wow. Which, God yeah, bless him. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, the other one, and I saw this um, from an athletic column. Again, there, there's a lot going back and forth here, but the centerpiece is Chris Paul for Ben Simmons. Yeah, I just I know what's gonna happen to Chris Paul when he sign when he when that trade is done, <laughs> like he's just gonna like disintegrate. Like I don't know, I don't know. It'd be tough to do that. Like I think you'd have to look at um, having some kind of insurance policy that if Chris Paul inevitably gets hurt because he's gonna come to the Sixers and that is how the Sixers <laughs> operate, you'd need something. Like if it was a Schroeder in there, but then at that point it's like you're giving I, up too much. I don't Sh- know. Like Schroeder wasn't involved in the, this deal that I saw the. Again, the centerpiece was was Paul for Simmons. The big thing was like Philly was getting like three first round picks back in this okay. deal, or, or yeah, three first round picks or something. Because mm-hmm. I mean, look, Ben Simmons has a much longer longevity than Chris Paul. Simmons is signed for five years max deal, so he's not going anywhere unless he forces his way out. 
for five years. Chris Paul, he can opt out after this season. He's not going to. He's going to take that money. But like you said, he could he could easily be hurt. So I, I think the uh, those draft picks are almost that kind of insurance there. And just the fact that if you're OKC, you take an established player like Ben Simmons and you give up a couple of lottery tickets in the process. Like, are those first round picks, Heat, Clippers, you don't know where they're going to fall. Are those guys going to be better than Ben Simmons? I, I would take the sure thing in Ben Simmons over these yeah. lottery tickets. Do you agree with me that Simmons has more trade value than Embiid? Oh, Because like, yeah. I'm kind of convinced. Yeah, right. I, I think so. Largely because he can handle the ball. And like yeah. centers nowadays, all right, you've got Anthony Davis, you've got Jokic, they're killing it. Embiid's not those guys. Like Embiid is, he didn't, I mean, Jokic is like, doesn't look athletic as all at all. Like he has the sneaky athleticism. Embiid mm-hmm. already with these injuries has kind of hurt his athleticism. Not a good three point shooter. Um, not, not a good playmaker out of the post right. either. Like he's just, He's not as good as Davis or Jokic. I'm, is Embiid as good as Towns? Towns is a, he's, a legit three-point shooter. Like, he's not as good as Towns, probably, if you just, like, sat down and ranked their skills. But, like, if they play each other, Embiid is going to absolutely... Like, just because yes. of the way they... Like, Embiid's strange because he'll frustrate you, but if he's interested in having, like, one of those big man matchups, it's tough for anyone. The issue with Embiid is he's kind of like a throwback. Right, and that's yeah. why people liked him initially. The problem is, you know, a different team it wouldn't be as big a problem. But unfortunately, <laughs> look at our team; it's tough to have a throwback in a team of like kind of. It's like a nineties team, and that was the whole thing. We're going to be tough, and they wasn't really tough. Anyway, that's nothing. But I agree, Simmons has got high trade value. I we spoke about this a little bit off air, but like they keep doing these Bulls trades, right? And it's like I see Chicago Bulls fans being like, "Man, we're giving up a lot for Ben Simmons in this deal." And my response to them would be like, yes, you should do that. Ben Simmons is, like, very interesting. If you want to build around him with a clean slate, there's a lot of things you could do with him, right? Like, there's the obvious Giannis deal. We just spoke about it. Small ball five. He's an incredible defender. Like, Dude, I... Something. I don't know. My I, I tweeted this. Like, I did a 2K fantasy draft, the current NBA players, and I picked, like, 18th or something. And Ben Simmons was there at 18. And Jimmy right. Butler was there. Chris Paul was there. There were, like, other good players they're at 18. Uh, but I saw Ben Simmons, and I'm like, They've, he's amazing in 2K. Because if yes. you put a guard on him, he posts up. If you if you put a big man on him, he just easily cooks that guy. And just surround him with the right people. Like, I ended up getting Jamal Murray in the second round. Like, great. A creator who can spot up, shoot. Like, that's, mm-hmm. that's what you need. And I just put, like, shooters around him. Like, you should be wanting to give up a lot for Ben Simmons. Because right. he's young. He's on a five-year deal. Like, there's no chance he's walking away anytime soon unless he's mm-hmm. forcing his way out. And at that point, like, okay, you're going to recoup a lot of value if you're uh, trading Ben Simmons. But, yeah, you should want a guy like Ben Simmons to build around. The, you just need the front office to build around him. The mm-hmm. Sixers did not do a good job of that. There's a lot of interest in things to be taken from. If you watch, like, the Heat and the Bucks, this this uh, playoff run, right? I've seen so many people saying the deal where you just put shooting around doesn't work because look at the Bucks. It's not that so much as they're very simplistic with how they do it in Milwaukee, right? Like, it's literally, you the what you is, he's going to put his head down, drive, and try and kick it if he has to. Yeah. The heat, and this is going to sound bitter, so just <laughs> let me finish my point, okay? Everyone's doing the deal with Butler where it's like, he's the man, like, Jimmy Butler, and he's awesome, don't get me wrong. But he's actually doing something very similar to what he did in Philly last year, where he's like basically just sort of chills out. He gets other guys involved. He handles the ball a lot. And in the fourth quarter, when everything slows down, he's like, okay, time. I didn't think he'd be able to do that in Miami because I didn't think their, their roster was good enough. Clearly, like, Bam has got way better. Tyler Hero has turned out to be like a real thing, right? Duncan Robinson, like, who's that coming? But Dragic, even. There is not enough, yeah, there's not enough talk, though, about, like, as good as all these players are in division, and yeah, they're cool stories. Watch every team in the playoffs this year. Spolstra's offense is a different level, man. Like, honestly, yeah. watching his offense versus Brad Stevens is stark. And I'm not saying this to take away from what Butler's doing. I'm just saying 
people that think this is like a team where it's like, yeah, Butler's the guy, just give him the ball and he'll score. But that hasn't been what he's done all season, right? Like, he's a 20-point guy, very good scorer, but he's not like a, he's going to go off and get 50 guy. They play as a team. Like, everyone gets shots, the ball moves, guys are cut in. So if you had a, an offensive system like that, and I know that's rare, right? Spolstra special, but like, you can do the thing where you surround people with shooters. They've done it with Bam and Jimmy. Like, neither of those guys are shooters. It's, it's the way it's done, I think. Oh, 100%. Like, you've got to tailor your offense for for who you have. And if mm-hmm. you can put shooters <clears throat> around Ben Simmons, again, you can do so much with this guy. You can... Yeah. It doesn't even have to be... Because uh, this this was certainly a problem in in Milwaukee. It's like, the offense just... It wasn't... It wasn't very good. Like, they didn't do enough right. pick and roll stuff, and anything like that. It was a lot of just, like, drive and kick kind of stuff. Um, but with with Ben Simmons, you can do pick and roll stuff. Space out shooters. You either tag the roll man, Simmons finds the guy in the corner, wh- whatever you want to do. Pick and pop. S- Dude, Simmons, his length, his finishing ability, he's finishing if he gets to the rim. Uh, they, like I said, post-ups. If a guard, like, if you try to put a guard on him or something – post up a double will come you have a shooter find the shooter like that's mm-hmm. not difficult this is what uh i was watching it was a long time ago lebron uh, against uh okc and i think this is actually last season when he was on the lakers and lakers didn't have like a ton of shooting right. but they ran like the same play just multiple possessions and, and this was when robertson was hurt i think like ferguson was guarding LeBron in the post. And, like, that's that's a complete mismatch. So, yeah, like, it, like high post, LeBron would just post up Ferguson, and they would just surround him with shooters. And any time a double came, LeBron would just find it, and you get a wide-open three out of it. And if right. the double never came, LeBron would just destroy Ferguson in the post. Mm-hmm. Like, it's not difficult stuff. But if you have a guy with that kind of vision, that kind of passing, that kind of athletic advantage – you can do these things. I I absolutely love Ben Simmons, and I would take him on my team in a heartbeat. Like Simmons, Schroeder, Shea. You got to do something with Stephen Adams. You got to trade him. Uh, Gallinari though, as a spacer, yeah. Baisley's improving a lot. Even Dort. Like I, I'd roll with that team in a heartbeat. It's interesting too when you talk about all the stuff you can do. Like if you look at the way the Heat use Ban. Where they give him the ball at the elbow and he'll like flying cutters. Like, yeah, it looks so simple when you watch them do it. And then whoever they're playing against will come down and have this like rigid ISO style. <laughs> it's it's something, man. I'm I'm with you. And the biggest thing with Simmons, like we saw out all the things you can do offensively. But like, I believe the stat was he guarded the best player on the opposing team more than any other player in the league this year. Like he every time whoever came to Philadelphia, it was like who's the best player Simmons is guarding him. Whether he was the big man, you know, like the wing. That's a real benefit too, right? Like, yeah. I mean, Boston would have beat Philly regardless, but if people didn't get how good of a defender Simmons was before, watching Tatum go off without him <laughs> there was like, get it now, because he's so versatile defensively. I'm with you, man. I'm, I mean, I'm a big fan, and this has now become the Ben Simmons podcast, <laughs> but it is, while I appreciate the memes, and it is insane that the man just refuses to shoot the ball, like, actually somewhat scary that he hates it so much, it is a bit of a shame that he's been mean to the point where people are like, they just don't even think he's like a good player. Yeah. That's kind of wild to me because he's very, very good. And it's, I get it, right? It's a weird thing with him, but he's very good. Very, very good. It'd be interesting to see him elsewhere, even if I don't want to for obvious reasons, right? I, I will take Ben Simmons. You can have uh, Chris Paul and I love Chris Paul, but I, I will gladly yeah. take Ben Simmons as, as a future Thunder for at least the next five years. Uh, if you enjoy our basketball talk, look at this segue. If you enjoy our basketball talk, Michael Thompson is scheduled to be on the Thursday show. NBA champion. I like how you just like laugh. Like this is a real thing that you still can't believe. <laughs> Insane. It's just like, I don't know if he knows. Does he even realize yet what he's coming on? This is going to be something. Like, I don't Where, know how this is going to Look, I say done. scheduled. You never know. Things can fall through. We're in communication. Things are good right now. I'm I'm, I'm going to talk to him tomorrow, shore up things and whatnot. But every everything, as far as I know, is a go for right now. Plans can change. Plans can change. Hang on a second. What kind of terms are you on with him? You, like you're talking every day at this point? No, we're not talking every day. I just shoot him okay. messages and just making sure we're good to go, all right? I, this is a big okay. get for us, and I want to make sure nothing falls through here. Um, this is something else. I could... <laughs> This is one of the rare deals where it's like, we've had some great guests on, 
but it's very seldom I can say like people in real life like yeah we had you know this person I'm like, they're not that deep in the wrestling media bubble which is what our show is generally <laughs> and now I'm like you know Clay Thompson yeah his dad's coming on hey take that bro we're talking wrestling with Clay Thompson's dad take that I do text I text like my basketball friends and be like yeah we're having Michael Thompson on and if they some of them are younger so they're like Who, who's michael thompson i was like clay thompson's dad and they're like oh my god like okay and people are just like stunned that this is a real thing i'm stunned i am it's stunned real... yeah i'm on the podcast <laughs> I'm, I'm quite literally stunned so yes yeah, so i understand why it's something man i don't know uh so he's gonna be on the show thursday we're gonna be talking uh wrestling and basketball we're obviously gonna talk plenty of basketball i'm gonna ask him if uh, his son will apologize to me for the torment he put me through in 2000. This is a real thing that I'm doing. Uh, <laughs> I want his son to apologize to me for the torment uh, for 2016. So Michael Thompson will be on the show on Thursday. Joseph, what are we watching next Tuesday or this week for next Tuesday? So this is a big show, Jeremy. Right, This is a very big show. I've been told it could be our biggest show yet. Um and I feel we need the ultimate wrestling movie. Now, after watching My Dad is a Hill Wrestler, I may change that description. <laughs> but when I think wrestling movies, I think just one movie. It is the the cinematic vehicle of our favourite wrestling promotion, World Championship <laughs> Wrestling, who decided at the height of their downfall <laughs> that the way to turn this around would be to make a film in which we make fun of our fans. To which I say, thank you, because now 20 <laughs> years later... We are reviewing Ready to Rumble here on The Distraction. Big show next week. I'm excited. I cannot wait. Um, and on top of reviewing Ready to Rumble, we are going to have another Thompson on our show. Yes. Andrew Thompson uh, from Post Wrestling is going to join us to talk about Ready to Rumble. So check out that show. Andrew, he's got a new podcast debuting on Post this weekend. Uh, so head over to Post Wrestling, support Andrew. Head over to his YouTube channel, support him there. Uh, AD Thompson underscore underscore on twitter all of his stuff is there but support andrew good guy great guy um he's gonna be on the show next week we're gonna talk ready to rumble michael thompson on thursday i am streaming i did a battleground stream this past saturday you can watch that i have battlegrounds do you have you played it well i think it's good is that allowed can i say that i like i enjoyed it it got very do you have it on playstation 4 yes okay let's let's play online let's stream and play online okay this is gonna be something. Okay, we'll do that. Uh, because I like I enjoyed it. It got very repetitive for me uh, on Saturday night, and maybe it's because I, I didn't know quite what I was doing just yet. I did watch uh, other people play Battlegrounds, and I saw oh, you can do a lot of cool stuff that I just didn't do because I was trying to win matches. And maybe yeah. I should just start trying to do more cool stuff instead of trying to run through the campaign mode. It's it's not for everyone, I would assume, but for what I would like in a wrestling game, yeah. Pretty close to perfect because I can literally just sit down and be like, yeah, that was dumb, turn it off. Like, I don't need to. <laughs> if, you, if you watch the show, you can probably imagine what I'm like as a gamer. Very much fits my needs. It's, it's fine. There's a lot of locked wrestlers, though, which is tough. Yeah. Because like, doesn't want to grind the game, you know? Yeah, that, and that was the other thing is I wanted to play the campaign mode to, like, unlock everybody. And then the campaign mode just got super repetitive on, on matches and whatnot. Right. So like, I want to do like Royal Rumbles and triple threats and stuff and face Dolph Ziggler 20 times. Like, mm -hmm. Who cares about yeah. that? Uh, so, so I feel that, but I did stream battlegrounds. I'm going to try to stream something this weekend, but there's clash of champions and a UFC pay-per-view this weekend. So I have to figure out a time. Joseph and I are going to stream battlegrounds at some point. I've just, we made are that decision. Yeah. This, this is happening. We're going to stream Battlegrounds with the 10 wrestlers that are given to you at the start of the game. That's what we're going to do. No, but if, if right one now. of us has them unlocked, we can use them. So if you unlock okay. if you unlock somebody, like you can use them in the game even if I don't have them unlocked. This is very exciting. Yeah. I'm ready to lose while pretending that I don't want to win at Battlegrounds. That's my play. <laughs> and if I win, I'll be very magnanimous, I promise. Maybe... Um, I don't know what your weekends are. We'll we'll discuss this off air, but okay. I do I do want to stream Battlegrounds with you. I think it'd be fantastic. We're now doing we've done the Ben Simmons podcast followed by a Battlegrounds review followed by like a production meeting. <laughs> Speaking of production, I hope Andrew shows up for the podcast. I know he's big time now and he's like made it. He's kind of Hollywood, right? Like he yes. doesn't really. But like we we had this deal scheduled and he was like, I can't do it. Like tell Holber, it's, you know, it's not big enough deal with me. My schedule is stacked. Just hope he turns up. That's all I'm saying, guys. Um. I have a feature this week, Jeremy. Yes. And it is not Dominic Mysterio. 
He's not on the card. Am I correct on this? Uh, as of now, he's not. I don't think he'll be on the card either. But... I did a full Dominic feature. Now, the end was like, and at Clash of Champions, he will not be on the card. That's the end. <laughs> but there's no kind of tie-up. But yes, I have a feature, the Jay Uso. 1,400 words about Jay Uso. Not just Jay. Granted, Jimmy is mentioned quite a bit. But that is a pretty fun one. And I hope everyone reads that or pretends to and does a retweet. That would be very nice. Uh, what else is going Nothing else goes on on Twitter these days. I've retired. I was Twitter famous, but now I produce content again. Um, I will be back on Thursday interviewing Michael Thompson. That's fun. And then I will be uh, playing Battlegrounds. That's all that's happening this week. So, yeah, Joe Holbert 5. That's where I'm at. There you go. You can follow me on Twitter. That was good. Yeah, that was very good. You can follow me on Twitter at Jeremy Lambert 88. We'll be back Thursday with Michael Thompson. Talk to you guys then.